so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. This episode names deceased Indigenous people and contains the recounting of traumatic events. Listener discretion is advised. It's an hour and a half before sunset on a Sunday afternoon in June 1838. A group of Indigenous Australians, the Weraray people, are cooking their evening meal. As the day nears its end, things are quiet, calm. They're at Mile Creek Station in northwestern New South Wales. They've been camped there for a few weeks, seeking safety and protection from stockmen who have been roaming the district, killing any Indigenous person they could find. And then they hear something. A rumbling. The sound of horses' hooves. Eleven men can be seen in the distance, galloping towards them at speed. The women grab their children. Two young boys run and dive into a nearby creek. The rest of the group, about 28 in total, scramble towards the huts, hoping that the white men would protect them. Instead, they're tied up and led away from those huts. What happened would come to be known as the Mile Creek Massacre, a crime Australians must never, ever forget. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with former senior Crown Prosecutor Mark Tedeschi. In his 35 years as a barrister and Crown Prosecutor, Mark oversaw some of Australia's most significant criminal cases. He's also published a number of works, including three true crime books, the latest of which, titled Murder at Mile Creek, details a trial of 11 stockmen who were charged with the murder of 28 Indigenous Australians at Mile Creek in 1838. So it's late afternoon on the 10th of June 1838 and a group of men led by John Henry Fleming headed in the direction of Mile Creek Station. What was their plan that day? Their plan very clearly was to decimate the Weraray tribe that was camping very peacefully at Mile Creek Station. They'd been there for some months. They'd sought sanctuary there because they were fleeing other groups of white settlers and their convict workmen who were marauding around the district in the New England area of New South Wales. And... Clearly, their aim that day was to massacre the tribe or whoever amongst that tribe they could find. And what was their motivation? What motivated them to do it that day? Look, that's a fairly complex question as to what motivated them that day. The leader of the group of horsemen was a man called John Henry Fleming who came from a nearby station called Munji Bundy Station and he had lost some cattle. He'd had some cattle that had been killed by local Aboriginal people and it was basically a punishment mission to go out and massacre whoever they came across that was Aboriginal, whether they were responsible for killing the cattle on Munjibundi or not. It was a, a classic case of you know, we're just going to punish whoever we can find, whether they're responsible or not. And what do we know about the Indigenous group who they descended upon? Because it was men, women and children, wasn't it? Look, the adult able-bodied men, about a dozen of them, had left the campsite at Mile Creek Station and they'd gone to another station a couple of days earlier to do bark cutting in return for provisions. So they were gone and that left about 28 of the 
elderly men, women and children who were left kind of without any defences really at uh, Mile Creek Station. And what were they doing when these stockmen arrived? It was in the late afternoon. They were preparing their evening meal next to the creek where they were camped. There were three wooden huts nearby where the three white stockmen who were on that station representing the owner, Henry Dangar, were living. They were camped nearby and they'd been camped there very peacefully for some considerable time. And George Anderson, who was a young convict there, he confronted them and asked what they were doing, these stockmen. What did they tell him? Yes, look, when the 11 armed stockmen approached the camp, the Aboriginal people were terrified. They knew that they were at real risk and they fled into one of the huts hoping that the two white men who were still there would help and protect them. One of them was a man by the name of Charles Kilmeister and the other man was George Anderson, whom you mentioned. Now, George Anderson attempted to persuade the 11 armed mounted stockmen who had arrived not to do anything to the Aboriginal people, but he failed. The other convict stockman who was working on Mile Creek Station, Charles Kilmeister, actually joined the 11 mounted men who had arrived at Mile Creek Station. So it made a group of 12. And the 28 Aboriginal elderly men, women and children were led away from the huts in a westerly direction. The adults were tied to a length of rope. The children were at their feet and they knew that things were not good. The women and children were crying. They realised that something terrible was about to happen. Did those stockmen, when they came to those grounds, did they threaten the other Charles, who was the other convict, did they threaten him to try and get him to be involved in what they were doing? Yes. Look, one of the armed mounted stockmen who had arrived, a fellow by the name of Russell, went up to Kilmeister and basically said to him, you either join us or you'll suffer the same fate as the Aboriginal people. So that was why he joined them. Was anyone able to escape? There were two little boys who, when the stockmen first arrived, they realised that there was danger. They were really little boys and they swam across the creek to the other side and ran away and they survived. And their descendants are still around today and the annual Mile Creek Memorial Ceremony that's held in June every year generally has some of those descendants and some of the descendants of the perpetrators who come to the ceremony. So it's a very meaningful ceremony. But there was also one woman who survived. Her name was Hepita. She was taken away with all the other Aboriginal people, but she was put aside and kept for the sexual use of the stockmen later. You can imagine what her fate would have been like. She was seen several days later in a terrible emaciated state being dragged behind the mounted stockman and no doubt she died a few days later and must have had a terrible time in those few days. There was also a woman who was given to George Anderson in an attempt to appease him and try and make him complicit in the killing but of course it didn't make him complicit at all. He did everything that he possibly could short of sacrificing his own life, to try and prevent these stockmen doing what they had in mind. Those group of 28 who were led away, and I believe it was a 10 or a 15-minute walk from where they were originally found, what happened to them? What was their fate ultimately? They were taken about 600 metres away to a stockyard And then the leader of the mounted stockman, John Henry Fleming, fired a shot into the air, which was heard by George Anderson back at the huts. He fired a shot and that marked the beginning of the massacre and the the mounted stockman then went on their horses into the stockyard and killed all 28 of them by sword, by musket and by trampling underfoot under the horses. So all 28 were killed in in that way, as I said, except for Hepita, who was kept aside. And the bodies 
were burned, which was an attempt to disguise that physical evidence. Yes, um, John Henry Fleming instructed his stockmen to make a huge big fire, which they did. He set it alight, he placed all the bodies onto the fire and he told Kilmeister to stay at the fire until all of the bodies were burnt. And this was an attempt to destroy the evidence of what they'd done. They weren't able to do that though, were they? Because of the amount of bodies, there was still evidence, wasn't there? Yes, look, the bodies were severely burnt, but when the manager of the station, a white free man by the name of William Hobbs, came back to the station, he'd been away for some days, when he came back a few days later, he was shown the massacre site by George Anderson, who had been shown the massacre site by an Aboriginal servant of Henry Dangar, the landowner, a man called Davy, who had not been taken away because he was employed by Henry Dengar. And uh, Davy had followed the armed stockmen and their prisoners to the massacre site, so he was able to show George Anderson where it was, and George Anderson was able to show William Hobbs. And when William Hobbs arrived, he found this terrible scene of all these burnt bodies, and he made an attempt to count the bodies, it was a very difficult task, as you can imagine. He thought that there were 28 bodies that had been burnt and he thought that he could identify one of the bodies because there was one elderly male member of the tribe, a man who was known by the English name Daddy, and he was an absolutely huge man. He was the largest man that anybody had seen in recent times. And when William Hobbs, the station manager, came to the scene of this huge fire, he saw this huge torso, which he thought was probably Daddy's. And a few days later, there were reports of another massacre, 30 to 40 people near McIntyre's station. Do you think that was the same group? Look, we don't know. But what we do know is that having killed these 28 approximately number of people who were at Mile Creek Station... The armed stockman, minus Kilmeister, went off looking for the dozen or so men of the Wereray tribe who had gone bark cutting. And we suspect very strongly that they were found some days later and massacred in turn. How did the authorities discover what had happened there? Well, William Hobbs was so horrified by what had happened that he wrote two letters. The first letter was to the closest magistrate, who was a man by the name of Edward Denny Day, who was the magistrate at Invermain, which is the name of the place that we now call Scone. And he also sent another letter to the governor of New South Wales, Sir George Gipps, telling both of them about this massacre and saying that something should be done. The governor was horrified, Edward Denny Day was horrified, and the governor instructed Denny Day to conduct an investigation to arrest the perpetrators and bring them to Sydney for trial and to try and get as many witnesses as he could and to bring them to Sydney to give evidence. And that's precisely what Denny Day did. He did a wonderful job of investigating it. He managed to capture 11 of the 12 men. The one man that he wasn't able to capture was the ringleader, John Henry Fleming, who was able to get away because being a free man, he had complete freedom of movement, whereas the others were all convicts, so they didn't have the same freedom of movement. And the people that Denny Day brought to Sydney included Charles Kilmeister, who complained to him that he'd been threatened, but Denny Day didn't quite understand what he meant by the way in which he was threatened. Mm. So at this point, they have witnesses, they have some physical evidence, they know the site that it happened. That's pretty clear-cut evidence, isn't it? Well, there was no eyewitness evidence. There had been an eyewitness, the man Davy, who was an Aboriginal, but in those days there was a law that in order to give evidence in a trial, you had to be able to take an oath on the Christian Bible. And in order to take an oath on the Bible, you had to have a belief in the afterlife 
and in particular in punishment in the afterlife. And of course, Aboriginal religious beliefs were completely foreign to that sort of concept. So Aboriginal people were not allowed to give evidence in those days. And as a result, there was no eyewitness testimony, but there was George Anderson's testimony about having seen these people being taken away, hearing the shot in the distance, and then going and seeing the, uh, the burnt bodies. Before we get into the first trial, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the historical context, because we're looking 50 years post kind of a colony being established. Was this level of violence commonplace? Was this something that would shock people, a massacre of this extent? There were massacres just like that, including some that were even more extensive, involving more victims, that were occurring all over New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria and Tasmania at that time. As the white pastoralists expanded into new areas, they came into conflict with the local Aboriginal populations and these massacres happened again and again and again. In fact, earlier that year, on what we now call Australia Day, the 26th of January, 1838, when the colony was celebrating its 50th anniversary, on that very same day there'd been a massacre of over 100 Aboriginal people at a place called Waterloo Creek in northern New South Wales. And the massacre had been conducted by a major in the New South Wales Corps who'd been uh, sent north by the governor. So it was almost condoned by the authorities. There was very little done by the authorities to stop it. Sir George Gibbs was very much against it because he had instructions from London to try and protect the Indigenous population. But there was very little that he could do. There was just such a groundswell of fear about the Aboriginal people, fear of the bush and a desire to expand the colony and a desire to take over valuable farming land and use it for the white pastoralists' interests. At this point, had a white man ever been convicted of killing an Indigenous person? There hadn't been, up until that time, a single instance of any massacre being prosecuted. This was the first time that a massacre had been prosecuted. There'd been individuals charged with murdering individuals, but there hadn't been any prosecutions of mass murder up until then. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Jessie Stevens. I'm speaking with former Senior Crown Prosecutor Mark Tedeschi about his book, Murder at Mile Creek. John Plunkett is one of the most important characters in this story. Can you tell us a little bit about him and his background and how he got to be in in the position of, you know, deciding on this trial? John Plunkett came to New South Wales in 1832 from his native Ireland. That time Ireland was part of Great Britain. He came initially as Solicitor General and in 1836 he became Attorney General. His family was an Irish Catholic family that had been persecuted and discriminated against for centuries in Ireland by the English overlords and it had only been possible for him to become a lawyer in about 1829. So only recently had there been reforms made to allow Catholics to take up high office in England, Ireland and the colonies. And he was one of the very first Catholics to be given high office in the colonies. Because of his experience of persecution and discrimination and his family's long history of that, he was absolutely determined that New South Wales was not going to go down the same track. He was absolutely determined that the law was there to protect everyone. When he arrived, his co-religionists, the Catholics who were already here in New South Wales, thought, oh, wonderful, finally somebody in high office who can do something for his fellow Catholics. Well, 
they were sorely disappointed in him because his attitude was one of, I'm not going to do anything for somebody based upon their religion. I believe in absolute equality between all people despite their religion. And all of his life, I mean, he engaged in public service in New South Wales for decades and decades, and he always held strongly to that view that religion was irrelevant to the law, irrelevant to the criminal justice system, and uh, the law was there to protect everyone. And what happened during that first trial with him as the prosecutor? Well, in those days, the Attorney General did all of the murder prosecutions. So John Hubert Plunkett was the prosecutor in that first trial, and there were 11 defendants. Plunkett knew that he had an uphill battle because the whole of the, or almost the whole of the colony was against the prosecution. The wealthy landlords were against it. The emancipated convicts were against it. Even the people who were still convicts were against it because they thought that the 11 defendants were all convicts and that the convicts were taking the blame for what really was had been done for the benefit of the landowners. The military was against it. All but one of the newspapers were against it. So Plunkett knew that he had a very hard task to convince 12 jurors to unanimously convict these 11 stockmen. But despite that, he, he put his best effort forwards. In those days, you could only prosecute for murder in relation to a single individual. And he prosecuted that first trial in relation to the man Daddy as the victim. And the trial was the longest trial that had ever occurred up until that time in New South Wales. It went for two whole days. So you can imagine what it, how long it would go for today. And the trial was held before the Chief Justice of New South Wales. Dowling was his name. And before the trial, Henry Dengar, the owner of Mile Creek Station, and another man called Robert Scott, who was a landowner, had done everything that they could to undermine the prosecution and to prejudice any potential jurors that might turn up. So at the end of the trial, the jury were asked for their verdict and they delivered verdicts of not guilty in relation to each of the 11 defendants. Now, at that stage, everybody thought that was the end of the matter because the general rule in those days was that if the prosecutor failed in his first attempt, no doubt his first attempt was using his best evidence and his best case, he wouldn't try using another victim. But John Plunkett, when he was asked by the Chief Justice, is there any reason why these men shouldn't be released and sent back to their place of work where they were assigned as convicts? Plunkett jumped up and said, well, yes, there is, because I'm going to put them on trial again in relation to another victim. And that caused a tremendous amount of upheaval, not just in the courtroom, but amongst the whole community because it was considered quite unfair to prosecute the same men in relation to essentially the same incident using the same evidence but for a different victim. But Plunkett was determined to have another go at getting a conviction. So he announced that he would put these men up for trial again and, and there was a hearing in the court which determined that he was perfectly entitled to do that. Now, the second trial was a little bit different. In the second trial, Plunkett, he did two or three things that were quite different. The first thing that he did was, instead of prosecuting the same 11 men, he prosecuted only seven of them, thinking that the four that remained would be enticed by an offer that he made to them that in return for giving evidence for the prosecution, they would be given their freedom. They would not be prosecuted. Now, he was sorely disappointed in that belief because these four men who were not sent to trial in the second trial refused to give evidence. And you can understand why they did that because you can imagine if they'd given evidence and the seven men had been convicted based on their evidence... They were still convicts. They were going to go back to their place of work. And when they went back, you can imagine how the other convicts would have reacted to them. They, they probably would have been murdered. So quite understandably, they refused to, 
cooperate with Plunkett. Another thing that made the second trial quite different was that instead of Chief Justice Dowling being the presiding judge, it was one of the other Supreme Court judges, there were three of them altogether, William Westbrook Burton was the name of the judge in the second trial. And he had a very different approach to the trial to Sir James Dowling, the Chief Justice. He was much more benevolent in his attitude towards the Aboriginal victims and he stressed to the jury in this second trial a number of times how important it was that the law was there to protect everyone and how how the life of every person, white, black, no matter what, the law was there to protect everyone. So that made it also very different. Plunkett in the second trial also did something very different. In his opening address to the jury, he said something that if a prosecutor said something like that today, it would immediately be the end of the trial. You'd have to discharge the jury, start again, and and you'd probably get reprimanded as a prosecutor. But in those days, what he did was perfectly acceptable. In fact, until about 30, 40 years ago, it was acceptable. And what he did was in his opening address, basically what he said to the jury is, you will have noticed that we're only prosecuting seven men in this trial. And if the defence don't call those other four to give evidence, you can only assume that their evidence would not assist the defence and would be against the defence because you might think those other four know perfectly well what happened. Now, today we would say that infringes the burden of proof where the Crown has to prove everything. It infringes the right to silence where an accused person in a trial doesn't have to say anything, doesn't have to call any evidence, and you cannot infer anything at all from the fact that an accused person hasn't given evidence or hasn't called evidence. So it infringed the presumption of innocence. But in those days, as I said, it was perfectly acceptable. So that was also different. There was one other thing that John Plunkett did different in that second trial. Henry Dangar had given evidence in the first trial. He gave evidence about what a scoundrel the Crown witness George Anderson was and what a fine, upstanding worker the defendant Charles Kilmeister was. Now, in the first trial, Plunkett did a fairly tame cross-examination of Henry Dangar, and I think the reason why was probably because he thought, look, you know, the jurors are all landowners. You had to own land. You had to have an income to be on a jury in those days. If they don't know Henry Dangar personally, they're going to be sympathetic to him. If I give him a hard time, they're going to be angry with me. They won't like it. So he gave... Henry Dangar, an easy time. But in the second trial, he just went in hammer and tongs and did a withering cross-examination of Henry Dangar and made him out to be an absolute scoundrel, which in relation to this trial, he was. And I think the jury would have seen through that cross-examination just what sort of prejudice Henry Dangar had. That was another difference. So... Plunkett thought that all of these differences would perhaps end up in a different result. And did it end up in a different result? Look, the way that it ended was very strange. The jury went out very early on the morning of the second day. It was about 2am when the judge commenced his summing up and 3am when they retired to consider their verdict. The judge had insisted on going all night. And the jury came back after what for those days was a long time. It was about an hour. They came back and the foreman was asked to stand and he was asked to deliver his verdict and he delivered a verdict of not guilty. And Plunkett was absolutely bereft. But then this man in the back row, this juror in the back row, put up his hand and said to the judge, look, the foreman's delivered the wrong verdict. The judge was probably didn't quite know what to do. It's a very unusual situation. 
I must say, in my more than 40 years as a barrister, it's only happened to me once in my whole career. Anyway, so the judge asked for the charge to be read again, and this time the foreman delivered the verdict of guilty. So in the second trial, there were verdicts of guilty against all seven of the defendants, and in those days there was only one sentence for murder, and that was a sentence of death. So William Westbrook Burton sentenced all seven to death, and about a month later they were all hanged in uh, the George Street Jail, much to the consternation of most of the community. There were petitions from all sections of the community, including from some of the former jurors, asking the governor to commute the sentence to life imprisonment, but the governor thought that this was a chance to establish a principle, and he refused the petitions and the men were executed. So you can imagine that it made Plunkett very unpopular for a while, having been responsible for these seven men being executed. So that was the second trial. And when you say that there were petitions coming from the community, did people think these men hadn't done it or did they think they had done it but it was justified? I don't think anybody thought they hadn't done it. What they thought was numerous other white mainly convicts, had done similar things and got away with it. They had done it for the benefit of the colony, for the enlargement and security of the colony. They'd done nothing more than what their landowner bosses wanted them to do, so why should they pay the ultimate price? That's what most people thought. And, in fact, one of the newspapers published what today we would see as a revolting article saying that they thought it was horrendous that any white man should ever be executed for the death of a black man. So that was the attitude in those days. What became of the four men who escaped prosecution? Well, that's also quite an interesting and involved story. Plunkett then announced at the end of the second trial that there would be a third trial and the other four men were going to be put on trial in that third trial. And what he had in mind was this. I mentioned to you earlier that there was an eyewitness to this massacre, and that eyewitness was the Aboriginal servant, Davy. What Plunkett had in mind was that he was going to get Davy instructed in one of the Christian religions so that he could take an oath on the Bible. He announced to the court that that's what he was going to do and those four men were then remanded in custody to await a trial early in the following year, 1839. And in the meantime, Plunkett asked a minister who had a lot of contact with the Aboriginal community, Reverend Threkeld, to instruct Davy in one of the Christian religions. However, a couple of weeks later, Davy disappeared off the face of the earth and was never, ever seen again. Now, nobody really knows exactly what happened to him, but there were rumours at the time that he'd been abducted and murdered so that he couldn't give evidence. Whether that was the case or not, we'll never know for sure, but there was certainly a strong incentive for the local landowners in the New England district to make sure that there was not another trial. So Plunkett then realised that the mood was very much against another trial. The governor had lost any appetite for another trial. The community had suffered because of these two trials and a decision was made when Davy was no longer available not to pursue the third trial and those four men were returned to their place of work and presumably live normal lives. Mm. Finally, I just wanted to ask about this landmark decision and having these seven men hanged for the death of 28 Aboriginal people. Did it change the relationship between Indigenous people and the colonisers during that time? Did it ease tensions? Did it set a precedent? What 
happened next? What it did, unfortunately, was it drove massacres underground. It resulted in massacres being conducted in a much more hidden manner, much more covert manner. So instead of going out in large groups of armed stockmen and rounding up Aboriginal people and massacring them in the way that had been done in this case, instead they'd poison water holes, they'd they'd leave uh, strychnine-laced flour for Aboriginal people who were starving to find. If massacres did happen, the bodies were disposed of properly, not left the way these bodies had been left. So unfortunately, it didn't result in the massacres ending, even though it did stand for the principle that the law would protect Aboriginal people as well as whites. But it didn't stop the massacres. In fact, the massacres continued right up until the end of the 19th century and even in some places in Australia into the early 20th century. So the massacres of Aboriginal people in Australia went on from 1788 into the 1920s. So for more than 130 years, there were massacres of Aboriginal people. And I write in my book about how we can now look back on that trial that took place in 1838 that was prosecuted by John Plunkett as being a type of war crimes trial. I mean, Obviously, war crimes were unknown in those days and any sort of trial was viewed as being a murder trial. But we can look back and we can see that there are similarities between what we now recognise and call war crimes trials and what happened in those two cases, those two trials. And we can only admire the people who were responsible for bringing those men to justice. Firstly, Davy who was brave enough to follow the caravan of death at a distance and witness what happened. George Anderson, who did his best to try and stop the massacre and notified his boss, William Hobbs, about it. William Hobbs, who sent the two letters that resulted in the investigation, the magnificent investigation that was done by Edward Denny Day at the instigation of the governor, Sir George Gibbs, And of course, finally, and perhaps most importantly of all, John Hubert Plunkett, the Attorney General of New South Wales, who prosecuted the two trials. So it was only because all of those people did the right thing that this case was any different to any of the other cases of massacres at around that time. And that it's a story we still remember. We know more about the massacre at Mile Creek than we do about any other massacre probably anywhere in Australia, because of these trials. Mark Tedeschi was a well-respected barrister and Crown Prosecutor for 35 years, appearing on some of the most significant criminal cases in Australia. His book, Murder at Mile Creek, documents the trial that surrounded the infamous Mile Creek Massacre in 1883, which would become the most serious trial of mass murder in Australia's history. You can find a link to the book in today's show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jessie Stevens. Our producer is Gia Moylan. If you want more true crime or want to connect with other true crime fans, search True Crime Conversations on Facebook and make a request to join our group. And if you've been enjoying our recent episodes, then let us know. Leave us a review on your favourite podcast app or share us with your friends so more people can hear our stories.